Hello, everybody. Q&A number 119. Yes, sir. Oh, my. Got to trim my beard. It's getting all puffy. All right. So we've got some questions that I'll dump, jump into. Um, so. We're going to start with Anthony's question. Anthony asks, Anthony, the question I was asking you about today is on page. In the Arbenz is page 138. Let's look. 138. Exercise number 34. Okay, what does doing this exercise help you with in your playing? I was watching a video of, I can't say her name, Tina, Tina Thing Health, Tina Thing Health, I have, I've never been able to pronounce her name. Um, she was playing the Neruda Trumpet Concerto in this piece. There are quite a bit of 16th notes that are slurred, or is it tied like, this exercise. So I'm guessing that this exercise in Arvin is sort of a way of preparing for concertos like Lemuda. Thank you, Anthony Lenzo. Okay, so um, that's a very characteristic articulation. Where we call it slur two tongue two. Slur two tongue two. And it's one of the most common trumpet, trumpet-y articulations. Hello, Anthony. Happy New Year. Um, so, yes, it makes sense that if you want to prepare for not just concertos, but any kind of trumpet playing, because this this articulation is, like I said, it's one of the most common articulations. We have slur all the notes, we've got tongue all the notes, and then just as popular as those two is slur two, tongue two. And that happens in music all the time. If you don't have the control to do that, then you're going to have trouble with those pieces. Now, here's the thing. You ask what the benefit is. And I think it goes way beyond just being able to do that in another piece. Um, I actually believe that slur to tongue to and other slurring combinations help you to tongue correctly on with uh, in terms of the air because you're going back and forth between using your air correctly right when you're slur you're using your air correctly now you're going to go back and forth between slurring and tonguing slurring and tonguing back and forth like that that's going to help encourage more a b better air on the articulation. I, gu I guess that's what I mean by correct. Tonguing correctly. When you tongue correctly, you're you're still supporting the notes the same way you would be supporting the notes if you were slurring. From down here, the same type of support should be occurring while you're tonguing as when you're slurring. And we use the tongue, I like to think of it as the tongue is shaping the note. That's the, And that's probably not my original, <laughs> right? Because that sounds very familiar to me now that I've said it out loud. Um, but yes, and, but when, when I say I like to think of it that way, I actually have an image that the air is like this, piece of rock and and with our tongue we are are crafting something out of that like a sculpture like the air is the rock and our tongue is the chisel 
sculpting that air to what we want it to be. So Anthony says, do you start it slowly, then bring it up to speed, go faster and faster? I'm not a big fan of the faster and faster part. I used to teach faster and faster. Um, I believe that the more you repeat it slowly, the faster you can play. A lot of times the reason we struggle with the faster tempos is because we sped up too soon. A lot of times we speed up, we, we, we increase the tempo too quickly. And it's, it's far, far better. I remember talking, when I first started teaching this way, I remember talking to some students and they kept asking, well, when do I speed it up? And I said, you don't. And they they get this like uh, look on their face, like um, like I'm playing games with them or something. And they say, "Really? So so I'm I'm serious. When do I start speeding it up?" I said, "You don't." No, I mean, when do I actually start making the tempo faster? I said, "You don't. Just keep playing it slow like that, <laughs> okay?" And and you know what? These students that. These first students that I started teaching this way with, it was remarkable. It was remarkable. So no, we don't we don't speed it up. That's how I feel about it. You just keep playing it slow, keep playing it slow, keep playing it slow, and you will have more benefit than you can imagine. Um, hello, Dave. Yeah, good afternoon. All right. So, now, so that's part of it. I I think there's um there's that aspect of it, right? So you have that immediately obvious aspect that if you can't slur those if, if you can't do slur two tongue two, then you're not going to be able to do that in a in a piece. So obviously that's the most obvious reason why you should practice this. But then there's that reason that when you slur two tongue two, you're going to have better air. And when you have better air, you have better articulation. But I think it goes even beyond that, right? Because when you, me as a composer, the articulation is part of the rhythm of the piece. And we need to be able, as as musicians, we need to, to be able to read each one of these different articulation patterns. There's slur two, tongue two. There's tongue two, slur two. Da, da, tia, 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 right? There is um, the, the one where you tongue one note, slur two, and then tongue where you offset it. <laughs> Uh, for me as a composer, um, for me as a composer, that's a different rhythm, even though the actual rhythm is the same. The, the way it is perceived by the listener is a different rhythm. They hear it rhythmically. When we change the articulation from slurring to tonguing, they hear it uh, uh, rhythmically. Okay, and there's the other one like that where you offset it and, and slur into the downbeat. Right? And then there's three notes in one. And then there's one and three. And you can hear each one of those has a different rhythmic effect. It's the same notes, but each one has a different rhythmic effect. Now, I'm saying that as a composer, but if it's true compositionally, that means it's also true, true um, then it's also true uh, performance-wise because what, what is perceived by the audience is something that we have to deliver. And there are pieces that I've written that 
I can actually say that if you don't do the slurs properly, that you're, it's just as bad as playing a wrong note. I can actually say that because it doesn't sound the same. All right. Um, so that's that question. I hope I answered the whole question. And so Anthony asked another question. Anthony says, uh, and this is, so Anthony's here in, in the past and the present. <laughs> okay. So um, he left, Anthony left questions on the website and he's here in person. So um, Eddie, I have another question. This is pertaining to the one range book. You said, you should play two hours per day, one hour on fundamental rest, one hour and play music, right? Um, okay, my problem is I have been doing it wrong. I play one hour trumpet pyramid, then rest for about 20 minutes, then play music from my teacher and music from band. So then maybe 40 minutes before my chops get tired. Now I understand break one hour, then you come back. The way my situation is, I am out most of all the morning. Oh, I won't read all that. <laughs> um, basically, he's des ex describing um, time constraints. So let's let's talk about this on a couple different levels. First of all, I don't say you should play two hours a day. That's a hypothetical example. A lot of my students don't have two hours to practice per day. Uh, um, I have students right now that come weekly that have no more than 30 minutes a day. And if they get 30 minutes, they're actually fortunate. They actually have, hello, Gabriel. Yes, I understand. You you told me that you work on Saturday. So thank you for popping in. Um so yes, the 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 times that I talk about in the um one range book are hypothetical. Now the one range book works no matter if you're practicing a half hour a day or four or five hours a day, the one range book works. You just have to apply the principles. Once you understand those principles about how we build strength and how we gain range, remember that's that book covers both of those things. Having strength and having range are not the same thing. The I don't think we need as much rain, uh, much as much strength to have range as a lot of people believe. I think familiarity is more important than strength, but the problem with with strength is that it's sort of like a it serves as a threshold. If you don't have at least enough strength to get over the threshold, it doesn't matter how familiar you are, you can't play the notes. And, and I know that sounds like I'm contradicting myself um, because that sounds almost like what other people teach. The difference between what I'm saying and what they're saying is that I think that threshold is very, very low. And what they teach is to play high, you have to have really strong chops. I think that threshold is down here. Okay, and you know, anyway, I hope that makes sense. So I, I think the concepts in the One Range book work regardless of how much time you have to practice. You just have to use that time wisely. Um, there's some students that I have. Um, I have a student that would surprise you and what's surprising about him is, is just how little he practices, right? He's lucky to get 
Uh, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, if I'm not misunderstanding what he tells me, he's lucky to get an hour a week. I think we do more in his lesson than he does sometimes. Sometimes I, I mean sometimes he'll have a good week and practice for a few hours, right? I'm, but most of the time, because he's such a busy man, um, uh, with work and all the other stuff he does. Uh, he doesn't have time to practice the way some other people would. Yet, because he's using what I teach him, he's still making progress. So, like, um, his range recently went up. Now, there's no explanation for that other than he's getting more familiar with the notes. Because, you know, people talk about, and this is a silly thing, people talk about, getting atrophy in the lips if you don't practice all the time. That's just stupid. That's just a dumb thing to say. Because atrophy, first of all, if that was true, students like my student wouldn't be able to do what they do. I think that's a... a, a, a a mischaracterization of what atrophy even is. Okay? Um, and so, also, the idea that you would even lose strength by not practicing every, every day, that's preposterous. It doesn't happen. I can go sometimes a few weeks without practicing. I don't like to, but I can. I can go a few weeks without practicing. It has no effect on my playing. Uh, okay, I shouldn't say no effect. You know where I where I lose it? Sight reading and improv. And I think a lot of that has to do with the way my brain is wired. So if I take four weeks off, and I have, by the way, if I take four weeks off, uh, my sight reading will be kind of bad when I get back. Will my chops be bad? No. I don't lose my chops over four weeks of, of, of not practicing. It just doesn't happen. Anyway, I hope that answers that question. Now we have a question from Karen. She says, I think I read or heard about this, but can't remember. How long should it take to go through the Trumpet Chops Tarot book from start to finish? Okay. Am I supposed to do, use the beat rest method for the exercises? Yes, you are. Today I am fitting it into my one-hour practice session. I spend I spent about 25 minutes on it this morning and have not finished. Thank you. Okay, so um, now when you're doing the, the chops tyro, the um, now I have an official time. Let me pull it up. Now, the official time is if you mastered it. It takes a little longer if you haven't mastered I, I actually had this <laughs> issue with one of my students because he was timing it, and, um, and I got some of it wrong somewhere. I don't know where I messed up, but I told him the official time. Oh, I'm looking in the wrong place. I told him the official time, and then it ended up being that <laughs> I couldn't even do it in that amount of time. You know, I think sometimes when you write a book, I think we, we get this idea that the guy that wrote the book must be, you know, like, I don't know, some kind of uh, super genius or something. And so I've made mistakes with the books a few times. And that was one of them, right? I have here somewhere. Maybe in a different.
Huh. I don't see it. Publishing. Oh, there it is. I got it. Okay. The official amount of time that it takes to play the Tyro is 30 minutes. I actually have a chart here. That was my goal when I set out to write it. And I measured it when I was practicing it. I made adjustments. If I couldn't get through... Now, this is the first time... Let me tell you this. This is the first time I've made this announcement publicly. The 30-minute thing was not for the public. I put this here so I could gauge how much longer each routine would be. So the... And maybe it's not right for me to actually sell, say this in public because then people will say, well, I couldn't get through it that fast. Um, it's not about that. It's not about that. I put these figures in here for my benefit as the person writing the book. That way I could organize each routine according to the context of the other routines, right? So. Um, each time we do a, a, a higher routine, so if you're on Tyro, that's 30 minutes. The player one is supposed to be 40 minutes. And it's 10 minutes each, 10 minutes more each time that you do it. Okay? 10 minutes more each time you do it. Now, it's you know, if you if it takes you longer than that 30 minutes, that's not a big deal. If you have difficulty getting through all of it, you might want to, um, you can split it up. You can do even numbers one day, odd numbers the other day. You can do that. I would, if you do start splitting it, I do recommend being organized about how you split it so that you don't, accidentally favor some exercises over other exercises because that is a thing. So I do recommend like having a little log book or maybe writing on the music itself, uh, which one you did on what date. So like if you're going to do odds on one date, then write that you did odds on that date. When you come back to the book again, do evens the next time. And if you keep track of it like that, you won't fall into that trap of of favoring some exercises over others. I hope that makes sense. Here's Anthony. Yes, Eddie, since I have been taking one day off, I feel my playing is getting better, and I feel less stress, me and my wife. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. It was like, uh, oh, my God, I got to get home and practice or I will not get better. <laughs> uh, which God is that? That sounds like the trumpet God, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, yes, you know, if it wasn't for this that I teach with the days off and the familiarity and the accumulative approach, um, I don't think I would have ever figured out this whole um, trumpet god thing, right? I don't think I would have ever figured it out because I would have been stuck in that same rut that we all get stuck in thinking that I have to dedicate myself to this instrument like it's, like it's a god, so yes, that's that's the um, the tyro. It should be thirty minutes. If it takes you more than thirty minutes, then then um, now let's talk about the resting thing. Because I remember when I had my son, I had him read the book in front of me. The first book. Um, the Trumpet Pro Book. I, I wrote the Trumpet Pro Book first because that's the one that my students needed at the time. So I made that one first. I did not write them in order. 
Um, so, um, so I had my son uh, play the, the, the book through for me before I published it. And one thing that I, now maybe I shouldn't be singling him out, right? But, but he's the one that helped me see that this, this resting between the exercises can be, uh, can go too far. Right. So if you have, if you're, ha if you have a, um, uh, let's say a scale. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, da, da, da. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, one, two, three, four. So obviously that way of doing it, um, I'm sorry. Um, obviously that way of doing it is going to put too much rest between the exercises. Okay. So now I don't sing and finger the exercises for the chop stuff, but I do sing it in my head. So let's say, let's say we want it to be exactly the amount of time between exercises as what you just played. This is how that would look. When you do it that way, you are getting exactly the same amount of time off the lips as you're getting on the lips. And that's very that's a very, very different way to do it. Then so it's not. Let's say, I'm not going to use the word different. Let's use the word more accurate. It's a more accurate way to make sure that you're getting that time off and you're not going to waste as much time just um, casually lounging around between the exercises. Right? I hope that makes sense. So... It can take that, if you, I can imagine if you, well, not just imagine, like I said, I saw my son do it, right? He rested between the exercises. I think that it took him, I can't remember exactly. I think it took him two hours to get through the book. And it's supposed to be a one hour book. That's how much time was wasted. And I didn't. So what? What I did with him was a, a um, a what do you call it? A I call it a practice test. So the whole point of the practice test. I haven't told you guys about practice tests. The whole point of the practice test is I keep my mouth shut, and I sit there with the laptop and I type comments while you practice. And the reason I do it that way is because when I stop you to talk to you about what you're doing, it, it interrupts your process. And, and me as the teacher, let me, and let me back up a little bit to tell you where that comes from. About 15 years ago, Basically, when I started teaching again, I went seven years without teaching weekly trumpet lessons. I never stopped teaching, but weekly trumpet lessons, I had stopped that for seven years. And so when I started back up again, I, I had, over that years, a lot of my method had solidified, and, and I knew how to say it. 
I knew better ways to say it. I knew you know, I was just a better teacher after that seven years off. And so, and so I, 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 I told the students about all these practice techniques. And I have this policy. I have this policy that says, don't ever assume that the students are lying. And yes, I understand that a lot of times the students are lying. But I don't assume that offhand, right? If the student comes, and this, this is part of the story, right? I taught them all of this stuff. I'm, I know I'm getting better at teaching. And, and so I, I share this stuff with them. And there, some of them aren't getting the results that I expect. Now, instead of being like some other people, and saying, well, that means you're not trying hard enough, or or you must be lying to me. You can't possibly be doing what I told you to if you're not getting the results. You know, that's how our medical industry works. <laughs> right? Um, if if you're still having that problem, then you 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 obviously haven't been trying hard enough. You haven't been doing well enough. I don't operate that way. And so these students would come in and I'm not getting the results from them that I expect. And I don't know. And I asked them, did you practice? Yes, they practiced. Did you use this technique and that technique? Yes, I used that technique. Okay, so how in the world is this not working? Then I had this idea. It's one of the best ideas, uh, you know, like as a teacher that I've ever had. What if I told them here, in the next 15 minutes, I want you to sit and practice exactly the way you practiced at home. I want you to practice exactly like you practice at home. Nothing different. I want to see what it is you're doing at home. And I'll keep my mouth shut because I know if I ask them to practice and then I interrupt them, I'm not getting that genuine image of what it is they're doing. So I would sit there with the laptop and let them practice for 15 minutes. And while they're practicing, I'm typing. Typing comments. And sure enough, sure enough, these students were not lying. They actually did what I told them to do. They just did it wrong. <laughs> right? <laughs> they did what I said, but they did it wrong. And they, they, they were doing it wrong in ways that I would have never guessed. They were doing it wrong in ways that I would have never guessed. And this, I'll tell you what, this really turned my teaching around. This really made a, had a huge impact on my teaching. Now, I, I want to be uh clear about this because I, I think a lot of my students now we haven't done a, a practice test in a long time. And the time to do a practice test is 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 when that happens. I tell you how to practice, you say you did it, but the results aren't forthcoming. That's when we do the practice test. So a lot of my students might be saying, well, you never did a practice test for me. Well, because you're getting the results that we expect. Okay. Uh, not that people wouldn't benefit just from doing a practice test. And by the way, uh, an alternative to lessons, and I have, it's been a tough sell. You know, I, I read a lot of business books which is ironic because 90% of what I read in the business books, I can't do because 
of my Christian beliefs, <laughs> right? A lot of it is just evil stuff. Um, but, no, why was I mentioning that? We're talking about, the, oh, they talk in, in the business world, they talk about how hard it is to sell something that, that you created, something new, something that's not on anybody's radar because it didn't exist until you made it exist. That's a tough sell. You have to convince people that actually there's value in that and and you have to actually, you know, do that in a way that, because we have these biases that are built into us and most people are afraid of, of new stuff. But I'll tell you what, I think, for those of you who are interested in this, I think doing a practice test can actually be more beneficial than taking a lesson. I charge the same. Okay, so for those of you that don't live in Houston, the way we would do this is you would make a video of yourself practicing whatever it is that you want to, like for example, a good way to do this is if you think you might be doing the one of my books incorrectly. You could practice, uh, video yourself practicing the book uh, either post it on YouTube or um, put it on on uh, on the cloud or something, on Dropbox, somewhere where I can access it. And then I would watch the video and send you the comments that I make based on what I'm seeing. And, and the, the objective of this is to help you fix what's wrong with your practicing. The objective is to help you fix what's wrong with your practicing. So if you, and, and so there's, my students are an example of how true this can be. You could be reading all the right stuff. You could be watching all the right videos. You could know so much. But what's happening in your practice room is something that none of these books, none of the videos would have ever covered. This is a thing. This is this actually exists. You can actually be doing everything correctly and wrong at the same time. Right? So as an example, right? Someone will say, okay, one, one of the techniques I teach is called working backwards. You don't start at the beginning of the song. You start at the end of the song and you work your way from the end to the beginning. And I can tell you in fact, one of my one of my on one of my new books coming out soon, and I say soon, anywhere in the next two or three years. <laughs> one of my new books is has the working backwards in it, and it goes into great detail about how you do working backwards. And I promise you, you could read that book and do everything that that book says, and we could do one of these practice tests. And we'll find something that you're doing wrong, even though you're doing everything correctly according to the book. And see, the way traditional trumpet lessons work, a traditional trumpet teacher would never find out that you're doing this wrong. The way traditional lessons work um, you're told that it's you're doing it wrong, you're, that you're playing the music incorrectly. Go home and fix it. And even if they do talk about how to practice, even if they do talk about how to practice, which is rare, by the way, right? Most people don't tell you, they just tell you, go home and work on it. But even if they do tell you, use working backwards or whatever technique that it is. I have a whole catalog of, of practice techniques. Um, I say catalog. It's, it's, I think I, 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 let's put it this way. I'm a connoisseur of practice techniques. I, I, anyone have a new one, I'm interested. I want to learn that technique. 
because the more techniques I have, the better I can, I'll be able to handle whatever situation comes up and the better I can teach my students. So, um, so yes, in traditional lessons, even if they tell you to use this technique, they will never know that you're doing it incorrectly. And in fact, part of that is what I'm telling you. A lot of teachers just assume that you're you're lying to them. You say they'll say, "Did you use this technique?" And you say, "Yes, I did." And they think you're lying because you didn't get the results. And in their mind, if you didn't get the results, you didn't use the technique. So if you, they ask you and you say, yes, you did, they think you're lying. Or they think you're just a, a no-talent hack. And I know this because I hear these guys on the gigs talking about each other. I mean, about their, their students. You know what the biggest comment I ever hear when I, I'm on gigs, right? And just about every musician I know teaches lessons, right? Just about all of them. You know what the single most common comment I ever hear from the teachers about their students? They say that my students just don't ever practice. And what what do they what do they mean when they say that? Oh, my students suck, and my students suck because they just never practice. This is just like the doctor that says, "Oh, the, the uh, you're still fat, and um, you're just not trying hard enough." The doctor just can't believe that you're doing what 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 the what the doctor told you. When it turns out, we we know today, right? Maybe you don't know this. We know today that what they've been telling people how to lose weight has been wrong. It's the same thing as the lessons. It's the same thing as the lessons. The teachers will always say, if if you're not successful as a, as a student, the teachers will always make that your fault. Anyway, so the reason I'm telling you this is because these, I believe that these practice tests are revolutionary. These practice tests are game changing. Because now, finally, we have an opportunity to see what it is that you're actually doing wrong. What is it that you're actually doing wrong? Not what are you doing wrong with your tongue? What are you doing wrong with your posture? What are you doing wrong with your breathing? No. What, how are you spending your time incorrectly? What are you doing in the practice room with your time that is leading to not having the results that you want to have? So the way just, and this is not an advertisement. I didn't plan on talking about this, but it came up, right? Um, the, if, the way this would work, the practice test would work, is that you tell me first what it is that you're having trouble with. We'll, th we'll talk about this in an email, right? Tell me what it is you're having trouble with. And then we'll, so like, for example, if, if it's, Let's say you're a high school student, just a hypothetical hy hypothetical example. And, and let's say you're a junior in high school. You've tried for all state twice. You can't even get past all region. What are you doing wrong? Well, I can promise you, it's not how you're playing the music that's the problem. It's how you're practicing 
That's the problem. So if you come to me and you say, Mr. Lewis, I'm having trouble. I want to make Allstate. I don't know why I'm not making Allstate. First thing we'll talk about is your schedule. Why, you know, when are you practicing? What are you practicing? But more importantly, we're going to look at how are you practicing the music? I have a video on here that's called The Worst Way to Practice. And I'll summarize it real quick right here. The worst way to practice is, because you know, for years, and I mean decades, for many, many years, I've been asking students about, you know, how they practice. And so many people, and not just students, by the way, I don't ask the adults as much because, you know, they don't like talking about music so much. Um, but I, I, I ask as many people as, as it seems appropriate. And you couldn't imagine how often the, the practice technique that is most common is, well, I don't know. I just open up the music and try to get it right. That is the worst way to practice. Open up the music, try to get it right. That is not a practice technique. And you know what that reminds me? And I, I would love to do a video on this. I have this new thing that I've been thinking about lately. I, I don't believe that people think. Most people. I, 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 there are some thinkers out there. But I don't think most people think. Right? I think most people feel. And the distinction is, so when, when, you're, when you're feeling something, yes, your mind is focused on that thing, but only to the extent that you get an emotional reaction out of it. And that's how most people operate. Most people, when they think they're thinking, when someone says, oh, go home and think about it, what they what 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 most people think that you're supposed to do is focus on that thing and experience the the myriad of emotions that goes with thinking on that thing that's not thinking that is not thinking that's feeling that's thinking on a lizard lizard level right they talk about the lizard brain that's when, when, when all you do is put that topic in, in your focus and experience the emotions of that topic, that is lizard brain level thinking, which is just feeling. True thinking is when you do something with the thought. And there's, a, there's different kinds of thinking. Like there's trouble, there's um, troubleshooting is a type of thinking. Problem solving is a type of thinking. Um, na narrative thought is a type of thought where you where you work in your head. Um, how how should I speak to this person? What if I speak this way to this person and, he, and this person responds this way? What would I say? That all of these things are are different levels of thinking, right? But I, I, I'm convinced today that most people, when they think, it's actually lizard brain level thinking. And I'm on a, a quest <laughs> to get people to start doing other types of thinking. And I, I'm convinced, by the way, if you want to start thinking, most people, the higher levels of thinking, the higher levels of thought, you actually have to write stuff down. You can't just keep it all in your head. Real thinking requires you to write stuff down. If you're not writing stuff down, then you're you're experiencing lizard lizard brain level thoughts. And all you're doing is feeling instead of thinking. So let, let's let's give you an example, right? Let's say 
an opportunity has come. You can take this job in another city or you can stay here with the job you have in this city. An opportunity has come up. Should you take it? Should you not take it? Well, lizard brain level thinking says, put the, put the question on your head and experience the emotions that go with that thought. Oh, I have a choice to make. What emotions do I feel? Fear, worry, excitement. That's not thinking. In my opinion, that's not thinking. Thinking is when you do a pros and cons list. I mean, that's one way to think. There's a lot of ways to think, but so you you say, what are the what what good would come out of moving? How much does it pay? How much does this pay? Put 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 the two across from each other on a sheet of paper. What is the the cost of living there? What is the cost of living here? Um what's the weather like? What's the weather like? You that's thinking. Okay? Now what's that have to do with what we're talking about? When you're practicing this where you say, you know, you know, this this worst way to practice is basically the equivalent of what I'm talking about here. You put the music in front of you and you experience the emotions of, oh, this is a hard piece. <laughs> you know? Um, that's not practice and that's not thinking. <laughs> All right. You don't have to be a lizard brain trumpet player. Okay, you can engage your mind. You all have this capability. You all have this capability. You can break it down into to sections. You can do, there's all kinds of things that you can do. Now, for those of you who don't know this, I actually have what I call a practice formula. It's very simple too. The practice formula goes like this. You introduce yourself to the material. After you introduce yourself, you, um, after you introduce yourself, hello, Karen. After you introduce yourself, you, um, what am I saying? Um, oh, after you introduce it, you repeat it over and over again over and over again. And some things that we do, we never stop repeating. Like scales, keep doing the scales over and over again. I've been doing the same scales since the mid 80s. So introduction, repetition, and then the last step is integration. So you take that scale and you mix it with that scale. And I shouldn't say scales, I don't teach scales, I teach keys, key signatures, right? Um, tonalities. That's why I call them tonalization studies, right? So um, it's that's very simple. Introduction, repetition, integration. You follow those three steps and now you're not lizard doing lizard practice anymore. You follow those three steps and now you're doing real intellectual practice so yes now where does i told you guys about working backwards where does working backwards fit in with the that formula working backwards operates as a introduction working backwards is how you introduce yourself to that piece of music Now, um, you can break that down on the micro level. So we introduce ourselves to like that last two measures. We repeat that last two measures 10 times. Then we do the previous two measures and repeat that 10 times. Then we put those four measures together and repeat that 10 times. Um, 
So there is a uh, integration built into the introduction. I hope that makes sense. Um, but it, the working backwards is for larger pieces, right? So if you're just playing something that's 16 measures long, now we still do, don't get me wrong, we still do, uh, we still do working backwards even for short pieces. But the reason I do that with my students is so that they get in the habit of using working backwards. The benefit of working backwards is on the larger pieces. That's when you get the most benefit. So like 32 measures or more. That's when you get the most benefit. But we do that on the smaller pieces so that they get the hang of the proper way to work backwards and, and learn a piece. Anyway, I've been blabbing and blabbing. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Okay, well, if I don't hear any other questions, then we'll move on. It's great to see you guys again. I'm going to try to start moving the, the time around so that we can get, because, you know, Gabriel can't be here at this time. What I might do is, oh, I won't say that out loud. Sorry about that. I have some ideas. Let's put it that way. Hello, Mr. Walker. Happy New Year to you, too. Okay, everybody. Any questions? We've got three minutes left, so. Yes, Karen, I answered it. About equipment. What uh, about equipment? I didn't see question about equipment. Let me see. So I don't see a question about equipment. Why am I not seeing that? Oh, maybe it was in my email. I'll check there real quick. So I, I did answer your other question. You said you asked last week. So was that in an email or, or was it on the website? Let me type your name in here. Yeah, I'm not seeing any questions about, so what was the question? Oh, do you know what? Maybe on last week's Q&A. Yeah, so this, the the question thing is hard for me because they're coming in from different sources. 
let me see here. So, how much difference does trumpet make in playing? Are you talking about like the brand? Whoa. <laughs> I, okay. So, the, the, the trumpet doesn't make as much of a difference when you're first getting started. Basically, and in fact, there are some ways to play when you get, like, for example, I think someone who doesn't play to the center of the pitch, the trumpet's going to make a lot less difference. Gabriel says that he had a question on tongue arch, but he'll ask on the website. Um, how much difference does the trumpet make in playing? I'm assuming that you're saying the brand or the quality of the trumpet. And my answer to that is that it doesn't make much difference. There are some things that, like if you, I know that for me, when I first played on a large bore instrument, well, <laughs> My this is my big fat man shirt. Um, when I first played on a large board instrument, it was like the where has that been all my life, right? I can't stand playing on medium large instruments. But how much of, the, of a difference di does it make? Oh, so the three different aspects. So the I, I talked about the three different aspects of equipment, internal dimensions, materials, and brand. And that's actually the order that the equipment makes a difference on, right? So the internal dimensions make the biggest difference. The materials make the second biggest difference. And the brand is almost if like if you have two instruments with the same material same dimensions but different brands you're not going to know a single bit there's no way to know the difference and a good example of that is i have a yamaha piccolo trumpet the yamaha was designed by the guy that designed the shelky trumpet so that's what i was told when i when i bought it and it plays like a shelky piccolo. It looks like a shelky piccolo. Um, now, people might say, well, it's not the same. You know, how much different is that going to make if you're not already playing at a professional level already? It doesn't make any difference. So what I can tell you is that if your equipment is too big or too small, it can make it harder to learn. So student versus professional is not that big of a deal either. Right? A student horn often plays just as well as a professional horn. So the question Karen asks now is, how would I know what works best for me? Um, and that's a trial and error thing. And I know that sounds like a very expensive thing. <laughs> but you know what? You can start with the mouthpieces. 
you can actually start try a, a smaller mouthpiece or a larger mouthpiece um so you can start with mouthpiece and ex experiment with that uh find the perfect mouthpiece for you and and you know it makes sense to learn get a mouthpiece first it makes sense to do that with a mouthpiece first so that when you have when you start trying different instruments you have like a, a home base to 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 launch from right <laughs> so there's always that so what kind of instrument do you have you know there is you know there are some of these really really cheap Oh, Blessing is all oh, extra large. Okay. So here's the thing. If, if it's extra large, then that could be causing your growth to be a little bit on the slow side because that is so... Because the resistance on the extra large bore is going to be lower and you're going to get tired faster. I actually think that's a good thing, not a bad thing. I actually think it's good to play on the large equipment to, to build strength. Then later, when you can switch to something smaller, if you want to switch to something smaller, uh then you can you can do that and get an instant boost in your abilities so i like to look at big equipment like that sort of like running with ankle weights on or running with a, a weight vest on you're just doing something just to make it harder and that's what that's like so you can do a blessing that's just a large bore or a medium large. Karen asks, can you give an example of something smaller? You can take exactly the same brand and um, and just get a smaller bore. So the part that tells me that it's a huge instrument is the XL. Now, unless XL means something else in blessing, let me look this up real quick. Okay, that's not what I thought it was. So I assume, and this is my fault, I assume XL meant extra large. <laughs> oh my. So what I'm looking at here, this is a good horn. For for someone getting back onto the trumpet again after some time off, a comeback student, this is a good horn. Yes, I wouldn't, I think, let me... Let me look at one more thing here. Yes, so that's the same, basically the same bore as uh, the standard buck. So I wouldn't, so it's my mistake. I thought XL meant extra large. So it doesn't mean extra large. That's a, an intermediate horn. 
and that's a wonderful horn to start with if you're just coming back to the instrument. Okay. All right, guys, I better let you go. God bless you all. Um, we will see you probably next week. I do have some gigs I didn't have originally, but they uh, now I've got gigs in the book for next week. Um, so we'll see. I'm not, I'm not going to promise what day we will have this. Okay. All right. Thank you. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. All right. Bye.